Hello, everybody. Um, so, yeah, here we are. Separated. Teaching remotely. Taking class remotely. All right. Um, definitely not something that we all had uh, kind of signed up for. Right or anything that we really anticipated, but you know, I'm certain that we can kind of understand and appreciate, um, you know, what's go, what's uh, taking place right now uh, as far as the the pandemic. So I think we can all understand the the necessity to do uh, this online or this remote delivery. Right, there will be kinks, there will be bumps along the way, there will be technical issues. I mean, perhaps there won't be, but you know, I like to be realistic. Um, so if you have a problem, a concern, issue. Um, obviously you've opened up this uh, presentation so you won't have an issue playing them but again they will play th through any device that you can you know watch a YouTube video through so smartphone you know uh, iPad tablet laptop etc right they will all you know, anything you can watch a YouTube video through um, so the fact that it's been well, I mean mm, the better part of three weeks um, since we had even talked about the endocrine system I'm really going to kind of jump back and really just kind of start it from you know start it fresh um, start it from a new I, I figured you know the fact that it's been this long it's kind of difficult to remember things to remember topics processes concepts that I mean we've really discussed for one or two class periods almost a month ago so again where we had spent the first month or plus you know six weeks of, of the course was talking about the nervous system remember the nervous system this is our body's way and means to communicate um very quickly right um there are for instance the nervous system <coughs> certain neurons certain um tissues through the nervous system can communicate in a matter of milliseconds right the hormonal system it's a means of communication however it occurs much more slowly right there are some hormones which can act quickly which may take only just a couple of minutes there are other hormones which take i mean sometimes take upwards of you know 12 14 18 24 hours to have their impact right one example of this is luteinizing hormone right luteinizing hormone is a hormone which causes ovulation in females that hormone is generally released around the 13th day of the cycle of the ovarian cycle and on the 14th day is when the actual oocyte is released so that hormone takes almost an entire day to have its impact or you know, to have its impact felt so again these asterisks these are the, the greens the green stars here these are generally what um you know organs are regarded to as the endocrine system i'm not going to ask you oh what organs are the endocrine system because there are many different tissues in the body which release hormones and they are all endocrine tissues however those glands those organs which are generally regarded as being a part of the endocrine system are those particular glands and organs which only like kind of where their entire purpose is to release hormones right for instance the adrenal glands the only thing that it does is release a myriad of different hormones right the thyroid gland right it releases it too releases a bunch of different hormones same thing with the pituitary etc the lung we all agree that the lung does many more functions than releasing hormones however the lung does release a hormone so albeit it's not a part of the endocrine system it does release hormones so it does contain endocrine tissues right same thing with the liver the liver can release certain hormones right but the liver is not a part of the endocrine system because the liver has many more functions than simply releasing these hormones same thing with the stomach same thing with the intestines right they can release hormones however their primary means of function is you know far exceeds its ability to release the different hormones so right when we think about it a neuron can you know when we talked about it a neuron goes and synapses or you know connects with a different cell or a different neuron of the body and it communicates directly that method right there are some other ways and we'll talk about it but one thing about our um, 
you know, the, the different hormones in the body. Again, the way these hormones, by, you know, for the most part, the endocrine hormones, they're dumped into the bloodstream. Right, they're dumped into the bloodstream, and they have to travel from one, you know, from point A to point B, wherever that happens to be. Right, there's all these different, right, uh, environments. Right, we see our our body cells must adapt and respond to a variety of situations. Yeah, let's just say I, hypothetically, right, went to Five Guys. I would, well. It is hypothetical because right now nobody's going to Five Guys. Well, I guess maybe they're probably still open. I think they might already take out. Right? You go to Five Guys, get a burger, fries, milkshake. You know, at least the Hershey location does milkshakes because that's the quintessential, you know, American American food. Cheeseburger, fries, milkshake, vanilla, throw a chocolate milkshake. You can do chocolate, but no, no strawberry milkshakes. That's just, that's just the bastardization of milkshakes. Anyways, if I were to consume all of that food, my blood sugar would be incredibly elevated. Now, having a very, you know, having an elevated blood sugar level, that is detrimental, right? That can impact a number of different functions from cortisol levels to growth hormone levels, right? Elevated blood glucose levels, you know, deteriorates the lining of blood vessels. So our body's cells have to be able to adapt to this. So one of the things our body cells can do is they can begin to store this blood glucose. Now, how do they do that? There has to be some hormone which kind of acts as a trigger, for instance, right? And there is. In our example of high blood glucose, right, our pancreas releases something called insulin. That insulin then travels around the body and it stimulates skeletal muscle cells to start to absorb, right, and start to store this blood glucose. Right? And when this blood glucose gets stored in the skeletal muscle cells, it generally is stored in the, uh, uh, in the form of something called glycogen. It can also get stored as something called, uh, or something, uh, uh, it can also get stored in the form of fat and other parts of the body. We'll talk more about that a little bit later on when we get specifically to the pancreas. So before we you know, trudge forward with the endocrine tissue or the endocrine hormones. There are other means or other ways that hormones can, you know, be delivered. We see, right, endocrine, the top left, right, right here. This is the bulb. We'll talk, this is where we're going to spend the majority of time. But autocrine, where we see affects themselves, cytokines, and really, by and large, um, um, paracrine as well. But autocrine, they are... So there are many different types of cytokines. They, by and large, have to deal with inflammation, immune responses, that sort of thing. They essentially activate themselves. Right? What, whatever it happens to be, what infl whatever inflammatory marker, whatever inflammatory molecule it happens to be, that comes into contact with this different, um, with this, with this, uh, with, with these cells, and then from there, these cytokines release. A hormone and then that hormone actually literally activates itself right it's almost having a light it's almost like having a light switch on yourself then you can turn the light switch on on your actual self paracrine cell you know paracrine release of these different hormones we see affects nearby cells an example of this is like histamine and what's called no or nitric oxide now, nitric oxide, let me move this thing down a little bit. Oops, so easy. And I'm pretty sure at the end of that last, you know, two seconds ago before I paused and, and fixed the uh, screen, I'm pretty sure you heard me say oops a daisy. So yeah, that's that's how my life's going. I'm using the term like oops a daisy. Anyways, um, <clears throat> we see the paracrine release. It affects nearby cells. This is like if you got bit by a bug. Uh, you got stung by a bee, whatever it happens to be. Now, ignoring like an allergic response, ignoring like anaphylaxis, ignoring like a if someone were like really allergic to a bee sting, for instance, ignoring those that's a little bit more severe. We'll talk about those later. But if just normal routine, ah, I got bit by a mosquito or I got bit by a bug, 
you kind of have that area or let's say if it bit you on the back of the hand you know that one small bite might be the size of a grain of rice or the size of like the head of a, a pen however the redness extends an area maybe the size of a half dollar or the size of a quarter and that's because those cells via paracrine release of these hormones surround or they affect the neighboring and the nearby cells hence the reason why you have that localized redness as opposed to this whole systemic type of release right then we see neurocrine, uh, neurocrine release neurocrine release we see release of neurotransmitters there's also um you know a couple of hormones which are released via this method we'll talk a little bit when we get to the pituitary we'll talk more about these different types of release via this method but up in here the top top left with the endocrine release again this is where we're going to spend the you know really the vast majority of our time so you can see right those hormones which are released into the blood a cell right cell releases hormones into the interstitial fluid then diffusion carries it into the blood yeah remember this is whatever endocrine cell you want to call this doesn't matter right all this kind of white space around here right that would represent all the fluid which surrounds these body cells this particular cell releases that hormone into the surrounding fluid which is the interstitial fluid and then that hormone gets carried into the bloodstream via diffusion now once it's in the bloodstream remember the the uh, bloodstream is just a interconnected river right if you want to get from point a to point b you just simply travel down the river until you reach point b point b is again what's called that target cell what is the actual cell that hormone wants to impact right and you can see that target cell is going to have a receptor for that particular hormone if it did not let's just imagine this green receptor here is the green insulin receptor this green in, uh, receptor only recognizes insulin so if cortisol came along and came into contact with this receptor this cell would not care nothing would happen whatsoever because this receptor only detects insulin right you don't have multiple receptors for you know the same hormone or vice versa one hormone doesn't affect multiple receptors on a cell right they have specific receptors for a specific hormone now there's different types of hormones right so right there, there's different kind of uh well yeah different types of hormones we see some are lipid soluble other while others are water soluble now this affects our ability to actually enter into the cell right remember how is it the fact that testosterone or how is it that insulin or how is it that cortisol or growth hormone how is it that it can actually impact the function of that cell because that's what's happening right if somebody scares the you know scares the crap out of you right somebody scares you your heart starts to race right you start to increase your breathing rate you start your body starts to mobilize fat stores your body starts to mobilize gly, um, glycogen and glucose stores all of these things are taking place so your heart muscle starts to increase contractility right your your um, cells start to increase rates of oxidative phosphorylation meaning yeah they're starting to increase the rates of energy energy production what's driving this is these di or are these is different hormones my example is specifically epinephrine or adrenaline right so depending on what hormone it is that dictates how it actually impacts the cell so one of the things with we see lipid base or lipid soluble and water soluble and you think back right to the phospholipid bilayer again we're going back to um right 121 even in like cell biology it, or even in biology in like 10th grade um phospholipid bilayer a uh, phospholipid bilayer it's a double layer effect which surrounds the cell right fats and waters don't mix right go grab a pot of water grab some olive oil you know don't waste the olive oil grab some canola oil or something mix them together mm, they don't like one another they stay separate right 
So we've got to have some other way for water-soluble hormones to, to impact the cell, right? Lipid-soluble hormones, if I'm a lipid, I like lipids. I get along with lipids. Well, the layer surrounding a cell, that's a lipid. It allows me through. I can get directly into the cell. If I'm a water-soluble hormone, that means I don't, I don't get along with lipids. So if I go to the door of the cell, again, that door is a phospholipid bilayer if i'm water soluble i can't actually get into the cell so i have to do use different messenger systems we're going to talk about those here in about four seconds well about 40 seconds the first thing we're going to look at are lipid soluble hormones All right, you can see lipid soluble hormones all right so lipid soluble hormones we can see once we're actually at you know the presence of the cell or whatever cell it happens to be, muscle, target, it's just the target cell. Whatever cell this hormone is going to have an impact on. We see it travels through membrane, it binds to the intramembranous receptor. All right, so it travels through the membrane. Yeah, lipid-soluble hormones are able to travel through the phospholipid bilayer. All right, and binds to the intramembranous receptor. All right, intra, well, within. Yeah, the receptor that's within the membrane. The nucleolus produces new ribosomes, which produce specific proteins. These proteins alter cellular function. Recall the organelles from chapter three. I know we're going back to 121, All right? But the nucleolus, that is the, right? The nucleus is where the genetic material, the DNA, that's where that's housed. The nucleolus, that is the dense center, right? I always kind of use that as the like pit of the peach. Right, whereas the, um, let's say the uh, thing of a peach, right, the pit is the nucleolus, but the peach itself is the actual nucleus. Right? Within the nucleolus, that's where the actual ribosomes are going to be produced. Now, these ribosomes are like little construction, you know, little construction workers or little construction worker proteins, right? Depending on what function you want the cell to, t you know, to carry out. That's going to determine what ribosomes are actually produced, right? If you want, if you're trying to build a building and you want to do carpentry work, you're going to hire or build carpenters. If you are building um, a building and you want plumbers, you're going to build plumbers, right? Same idea here. If I'm a cell and I want to increase glucose uptake, I'm going to build proteins which function to increase glucose absorption. Right, so that it's all dictated by what hormone is present, right? Because that hormone dictates what ribosomes are present. And which ribosomes are present dictate how the actual function of the cell is altered. So here's just some examples of lipid soluble hormones. Again, by and large, right, we see lipid soluble hormones, steroid hormones, as, as well as thyroid hormones. Right, so we think of steroid, or steroid. When we think of steroid hormones, right? Think of sex hormones like testosterone, estrogen, uh, progesterone. Right? Think of cortisol. Right? These are all lipid soluble hormones. And they're actually all derived from cholesterol. We'll talk about that in a little while. Thyroid hormone, right? Thyroid hormone. You can say T3 and T4, right? Thyroid hormone is a lipid soluble hormone. And then lastly, right, nitric oxide. That is also lipid soluble. So if I'm a water soluble hormone, and really the, the, the bulk of hormones are like that, right? Insulin, epinephrine, etc. Right. If I'm water soluble, I'm unable to pass through the plasma membrane. Right. If I'm water soluble, I can't get through. I cannot get through this phospholipid bilayer. Can't do it. So I have to have some sort of messenger. I have to bind to this receptor on the surface of the cell. And then within the cell itself, we see there's a second messenger or a secondary messenger. Long story short, what happens? Whereas in the lipid soluble hormones, that altered the, that led to the production of various ribosomes inside of the nucleus. Same idea, right? We have more proteins being produced. However, via these water-soluble hormones, right, they produce a uh, whole myriad of what are called protein kinases. 
these protein kinases are what actually alter the function of the cell. All right. So again, end result is the same. End result is the function is the formation of proteins. With the water soluble hormones, the activation had to take place through the plasma membrane, which led to the production of these protein kinases, which those protein kinases are what then altered this function of the cell. Again, that differs from lipid soluble hormones, where the ribos where the um, lipid where the hormone actually led to the production of certain ribosomes and those ribosomes are what then alter the, the uh, are what then altered the function of the cell. Okay. Here we can see right a number of different water soluble hormones, right? Epinephrine, histamine, right, oxytocin, human growth hormone. Really the, the majority of the majority of hormones that we're going to talk about, right, whether the, the, whether they are digestive hormones, right, pituitary hormones, um, um, it, really, I mean, the thyroid, you know, well, not thyroid, excuse me. There are a number of different hormones, right? Even, there are certain hormones which do come from the thyroid gland, right, which are not thyroid hormone, which are going to be um, water-soluble, right? Down here, something called calcitonin. Right, we'll talk about this in a little while. Calcitonin is involved with the regulation of blood calcium levels. So we see, recall the previous slide. Hormones cause cells to begin producing proteins. These very proteins dictate how a cell activity is altered. That's why a particular hormone can affect different cells entirely different. Insulin, epinephrine, growth hormone. Yeah, this is why. Right. How is it that epinephrine, right, it's coming, it scares you. Ooh, it scared the crap out of me. All right. Why is it that that can increase cardiac rate? It can increase respiratory rate. It can increase oxidative phosphorylation or energy production inside of the body. But at the same token, it can reduce gastric tone or it can reduce gastric motil uh, motility or, or it can reduce you know, um, intestinal motility. How is it can do, how is it that that one hormone can have two very different impacts, right? It can cause these tissues to increase function, but it can cause these tissues to decrease function. And again, that has to do with the proteins that that particular cell produces, right? The proteins which are produced in the, in the cardiac muscle via the presence of epinephrine increase contractility of the heart muscle. The same token, the proteins produced in the various smooth muscles of the intestinal tract decrease function in the smooth muscle in the presence of epinephrine. So we have the same hormone but different impacts. Other impacts, or what else can lead to the impact of the hormone or the, the influence the hormone has? We see the hormone's concentration in the blood. Yeah, the greater the level of hormone in the blood, the greater the impact. Right? The number of receptors on the target cell, right? This essentially leads to the sensitivity of that cell to the receptor or, or to the hormone. Again, we're going to cover that in detail next slide. Influence exerted by other hormones, synergistic effect, antagonistic effect. Yeah, the, the synergistic effect, right? Epinephrine, norepinephrine, right? They function together. Both of them function to elevate right, sympathetic tone. The antagonistic effect, growth hormone, right, and insulin. Growth hormone is going to lead to the synthesis of tissues. Insulin does quite the opposite. Insulin actually is going to inhibit the synthesis of new tissues, right? Insulin, there's an abundance of energy. If there's an abundance of energy, we want to store that energy. Therefore, we don't need to grow new tissues or you know, synthesize new proteins or new you know uh, new tissues so this here when we talk about right the influence of hormones on the receptor or the receptor excuse me the receptor influence on the hormone we see receptors can be what's called upregulated or down 
our body likes to be this nice even keel you know no you know doesn't rock the boat we don't have these peaks and you know these mountains and these valleys we don't or peaks and valleys we just have this one kind of almost like plateau of existence right we like our heart you know blood pressure 120 over 80 body temperature of 98.6 right normal heart rate you know somewhere around 80 beats per minute right give or take right we like to have this kind of nice even keel so anytime there's this overabundance of hormone or even if there's an underabundance of hormone both of those things can impact the sensitivity of those of the body's cells to that particular hormone if there is this huge release of a certain hormone if there's really high levels of a particular hormone that can cause that will cause the receptors to down regulate right if we look at the last slide well the hormones concentration in the blood is one of the in oops is one of the horm the hormones concentration in the blood that's one of the influencers of hormonal effectiveness so if there's a huge amount of a particular hormone in the blood that's going to dramatically increase that hormone's effectiveness. Well, I just mentioned, right? We like to have these kind of nice, even keels. We don't want to have too much of a response. We don't want to, we don't want to have too little of a response, right? So if there's too high a level of hormone, what our body cells can do is down-regulate, meaning essentially that the cell becomes less sensitive to that particular hormone. This is one of the things with addiction, right? When we talk about, for instance, dopamine, right? And the presence of high dopamine levels, right? Various dopamine receptors will actually down-regulate, meaning they'll essentially become less sensitive. So this is why, you know, uh, uh, drug users, for instance, right? when they kind of utilize, you know, use a, well, some illicit drug, whatever it happens to be, they get this huge release of, dopamine they feel you know on cloud nine they get that high well what then happens well if there's an abundant level of dopamine the body cells are going to down regulate meaning they make the receptors less sensitive so now once you know uh, uh, john smith comes off the high right their dopamine levels now return to normal the problem is, is that there's fewer receptors which recognize that dopamine. So now they feel just that much more, for instance, depressed, or they just feel like that much lower than they did prior. So to feel good again, we, you know, they then use it again. Why? Because they use it again. The dopamine levels spike. They feel like they're on cloud nine. The problem is that the dopamine, because dopamine is so elevated, the receptors even further down regulate so you can kind of see the you know the the propensity in the cycle same thing with insulin resistance right type 2 diabetics right again used to be called adult onset had to change the name when non-adults or children started getting it right so with insulin resistance right? same idea Right. When we consume, you know, textbook wise, I think it's every two hours of, of not eating is called fasting, which is just absolutely absurd. Right. Uh, but anyways, right. This the kind of constant idea or the idea that we need to consistently eat. Right. The idea that uh, we need to have all food groups at every meal. Right. That notion that we have to consume five different you know uh, food groups each meal is just I mean just lends towards overeating. Right. So throughout the day, yeah, absolutely. You want to diversify what you've consumed, right? You want to eat the different food groups throughout the day, not at each particular meal. But anyways, it's beside the point. Uh, with insulin resistance, right? Whenever we eat, now those foods which, are, which have a higher glycemic index. So what that means is those foods which impact your blood sugar levels more dramatically they have a higher glycemic index, right? A piece of cake has a very high glycemic index. A slice of pepperoni has a very low glycemic index, right? A slice of cheese has a very low glycemic index. A slice of white bread has a very high glycemic index. Again, the higher the glycemic index, the more it impacts your blood sugar levels, 
So, right in this country, you know, because of the not I'm not saying because of because of the consumption of carbohydrates, but because of the consumption of the type of carbohydrates for which we you know which predominates in this country, in you know our insulin levels are generally higher than normal, right? And so because of that, over the course of years, the fact that you know, and the, the average person in this country eats every 90 minutes, whether it's a snack, whether it's a bite of food, whether it's just a small piece of candy or one bite of a chip, doesn't matter, right? That that kind of constant, continuous, you know, continual eating just lends to the fact that insulin levels are always, at, at, at really, at, even at, at best case, minimally or moderately elevated. Well, over time, that causes down regulation of the insulin receptor. If it down regulates to the if if the insulin receptor down regulates, well it becomes less sensitive to insulin. So now your pancreas, specifically the beta cell, has to pump out more insulin for that for that um well I'm sorry, the, the beta cell has to pump out more insulin so therefore your body cells recognize and respond to the insulin. Right? And then as your diet doesn't improve if it just worsens over time eventually the beta cells just become you know fatigued they become tired they they peter out the beta cells eventually become exhausted and they die right that's where eventually right people who are type 2 you know type 2 diabetics or have uh, you know insulin resistant diabetes again they always they don't just start out of the gate on insulin, right? Type two diabetes, you know, insulin resistance is very different than type one. Type one, they immuno in in immuno component or an autoimmune condition where their own immune cells are actually attacking the beta cell. That is entirely different than insulin resistance or type two diabetes, right? Type two diabetes is a lifestyle. Right, or is 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 caused by you know lifestyle choices, dietary choices, physical you know physical uh, activity levels, those sorts of things. Right, we talk about oh well, my mother had it, my father had it, so therefore I'm going to have it. Well, the, the the correlation there is the fact that because you know for the most part we all eat like our parents ate. That's the correlation with oh my parents had insulin resistance, so therefore I'm destined to be also become insulin resistant. Yes, there are certain conditions where you are at a higher uh, likelihood of developing insulin resistance. Absolutely, but you know it is certainly not one of those things where oh my parents have it, so therefore I'm already predisposed to having it. That's just that's inaccurate. So I'm not going to beat this point too much. We've talked about this numerous times, um, even in 121, um, but we've talked about it before. I'll mention it again. We see this just deals with all right. How is it our body knows to release hormones, right? What 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 says to my body, hey, you better start releasing hormone X or hormone Y, right? Whatever it happens to be. We see most hormone regulations achieved via a negative feedback loop. So let's say um, in when we talk about heart rate, or right, talk about blood pressure. So what happens? How is it our um, in this particular example, uh, this example, oh, okay, this is this, uh, this one is just actually dealing with the hormones. That makes, okay, it's a terrible example. Anyways, right, this one is via negative feedback. So what this, what's actually happening here? How is it our body knows to respond? Our blood pressure is supposed to be 120 over 80, right? Again, that's ballpark figure, right? That's normal. So if our blood pressure starts to go to, uh, let's say, 100 over 60, all right, that could be normal for some people. But let's say if I usually live at 120 over 80, if I all of a sudden drop to 100 over 60 or if I drop to 90 over 50, I'm going to have a problem. So I need to negate that impact, right? I need to negate that low blood pressure. So what happens? My brain can speed up. My heart rate. So if I speed up my heart rate, that means my blood pressure starts to elevate. Once my heart rate or my blood pressure reaches 120 over 80, now my body removes that 
response, meaning it starts to slow the heart rate. So therefore now my blood pressure stays maintained. I don't want to just continue to have my heart rate elevated because then my blood pressure would go from 90 over 50 and it would keep going up and it would bypass 120 over 80 and it would reach 150 over 110 or 120, right? That's a problem. So the feedback or the, the um, change occurs until we have now reached, again, that level of that, that normal level. Now we see a few hormones operate via a positive feedback mechanism. Right, the, the very few of these, and the reason why is because this cycle begets itself. Right, for instance, if somebody, um, if you know later later in pregnancy, right, something called uh, corticotropic releasing hormone. Again, we'll talk about that. Well, actually, right, a month from now, we talk about um, uh, reproductive system, but in the pregnancy. Let's say mom starts to release oxytocin. All right. So oxytocin is going to cause the release, or it's going to, excuse me, cause the um, uterine wall, the uterine muscle, the myometrium to contract. When the myometrium contracts, that's going to force Junior down into the cervix. Well, that causes the cervix to start to stretch. When the cervix stretches, that then stimulates the, um, the uh, posterior pituitary to release more oxytocin. Okay, so oxytocin causes the myometrium to contract. That causes Junior to essentially get pushed into the cervix. That stretches the cervix. Well, stretching of the cervix causes more oxytocin release. And you could just see how that cycle would just continue. This is why when women are right in, like, oh, I'm in labor, it's not like, hey, I'm in labor for, you know, four hours, and hey, all of a sudden it just stopped. Nope, that's just not the way that it works, right? Once women are in labor, they are in labor until they get through it, right? And that's the one other thing about, um, right, the, the, the one thing that kind of halts the positive feedback loop is just once Junior is delivered, that massive uh, volume change in the uterus, that's what, you know, that's enough to break the cycle. Right. But short of that, there's there's not many. There's a couple other ones dealing with LH, but there's not many examples of positive feedback mechanisms inside of the body. So this here, right? This is kind of where we really start to get into. Well, what are the actual tissues, or what are the actual um, parts, or glands, or organs of the body which have a massive regulation in the hormones. You see the hypothalamus and the pituitary, those are really the two main, main uh, hormonal regulators of the body, right? The hypothalamus dictates what hormones are released from the pituitary gland, right? We see these hormones have a wide ranging effect, anything from, right, follicle production to oocyte production, to sperm production, to muscle sy synthesis, to uh, cortisol relief, uh, release to uh, breast milk uh, release and ejection. There's a number of different functions that these, uh, you know, that the hypothalamus and the pituitary can lead to. We're going to go over them each individually in just a moment. How the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus actually communicate, right? So before we get into well, how the hell is it that the hypothalamus actually, or how is it that, you know, the, um, right, that depending upon what hormones are released, what impact do those hormones have? First, we're going to look at how is it the hypothalamus actually communicates with the pituitary. And we see there's something called the hypophyseal portal system. That's something else that the pituitary can be called. The pituitary can also be called something called the hypothesis, right? So, so hence the hypophyseal portal system. And we see, right, with the hypothesis, there's two lobes to the pituitary gland. There's the anterior pituitary that's going to produce and secrete the different hormones. And there's also the, the posterior pituitary that's going to secrete the hormones, but those hormones are produced in the hypothalamus. Right. Now, the hypophyseal portal system we can see right right here. Let me draw a little line here. Right, the hormones that are produced in the hypothalamus get dumped into the bloodstream here. 
well, from you know the arterial side, blood always travels into the venous side. That's just the flow of blood. You know, flow of blood goes down the venous side here, and then guess what? It goes out in disseminates out in through the pituitary, right? Specifically, the anterior pituitary. So depending on what hormone is released, right? We'll talk about which hormones are are responsible for what, but let's imagine growth hormone releasing hormone is released from the hypothalamus, right? As it's released from the hypothalamus, dumps into the bloodstream, and then as it travels down the bloodstream, it's going to travel down, 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 and it's going to stimulate these cells called somatotrophs, which exist in the anterior pituitary. Those somatotrophs are going to produce um, uh, are going to produce somatotropin or growth hormone. So it all has to do with the flow of blood from the the, hypo, uh, the, hy, the hypothalamus or the hypothesis, or no, excuse me, the hypothalamus to the hypothesis. And so, again, what are the examples of this feedback, right? How is it the the hypothalamus knows to release a particular hormone. Well, again, it all has to do essentially with kind of a similar mindset as a negative feedback loop, right? In this particular right, example, we can see here, cortisol released by the adrenal gland. We haven't talked about what, but from the hypothalamus, there's something called CRH or corticotropin releasing hormone. That's going to stimulate the release of corticotropin. That corticotropin then stimulates the release of cortisol. So if cortisol was just released, do we need to release more of it? I mean, maybe if we have this high, high stress, high acute situation, but essentially once the hormone is released, we generally don't need to have further release of it. That's not always the case, but um, often is. So if cortisol has just been released and we have high levels of cortisol, that's going to inhibit further release of corticotropin releasing hormone. If we inhibit the release of corticotropin releasing hormone, that means we inhibit the release of corticotropin. If we inhibit the release of corticotropin, that means we no longer have any release of cortisol from the adrenal gland. So it's kind of one of those kind of self-regulation mechanisms by which the um, adrenal gland, or excuse me, that the pituitary and the hypothalamus function. So at this part, I'm going to separate the video. So um, here I'm going to pick up kind of all the functions of the different hormones on the subsequent video.